time, Canada was one of the safest countries in the world. Even now, we live so far from where the world's wars are usually fought that it's hard to believe all this could be blown away in a day. But technology and geography have conspired to betray the country. Where we live has become a nuclear no-man's land. American bombers heading for Russia will be taking off from Plattsburgh, New York, just over the horizon there. Soviet nuclear warheads will be coming in low from the north on their way to American targets. They probably hit Canadian cities too, but nuclear fallout and nuclear winter would destroy Canada even if we weren't a deliberate target. So this is a film about what Canadians might do in order to survive. In practice that comes down to what we should do about the Americans, because we've become very important to them now. We inhabit the space between them and the Russians. In these communist bloc tracks, this particular uh, Aeroflot, uh, which is a Soviet Union track, they fly quite often into Canada. They'll land at Montreal. They're not allowed to fly in, in American airspace. So what he did, he flew out quickly, due east, and then down the coast, of the United States to Havana. There are a lot of Canadians here at North American Air Defense Headquarters in Colorado Springs, and some of them have their hands very close to the red telephone. And the ultimate end, of course, is an all-out nuclear attack, when our missile warning systems are reporting missiles inbound. And the command director's responsibility is to accept that information, interpret it properly, and pass it to Commander-in-Chief NORAD, who makes the ultimate uh, decisions. And almost literally, your screen starts filling up with missiles. That's correct. What does that feel like? It's a sobering effect. NORAD is the defensive half of the U.S. nuclear war machine. But it's Canada's machine, too. In fact, NORAD's deputy commander is a Canadian general. If there were an attack on North America right now, who'd be in charge of dealing with it? Well, it would, that would be my uh, responsibility, since uh, General Harry is the commander-in-chief, is, uh, is away uh, at this point in time, so it would very definitely be me that would be the responsible person. What proportion of the time are you here and in charge because the commander-in-chief is away? Uh, I would say probably a good 25-30% uh, of the time. And if you're wondering what a nice country like Canada is doing in a place like this, well, that's quite a story. It was inevitable that America and Russia would become enemies after the last World War, simply because they were the two strongest powers left. We were bound to be allied to the United States, given our history and where we live. What was new was nuclear weapons. Overhand at 32,000 feet, a bomber is circling with its devastating bomb. This is it, with the light of a hundred suns. The strategies of our superpower neighbors rapidly spread out to include us as well. In 1949, the Russians tested their first atomic bomb. By the early 50s, both sides were building long-range bombers that could fly directly across the Arctic. So both the Russians and the Americans started building air defense systems. For Washington, that meant stopping the bombers over Canada. It was certain that if the Americans came to the conclusion that they needed a defense system, they were going to have it. And uh, uh, we'd better make damn sure that in our own interests that we were a party to it. The radar stations began to march across Canada's north, and the United States Air Force started to push for a joint command that would give it free use of Canadian airspace. But the Saint Laurent government didn't want Canada to be swallowed up in an all-American defense system. Our defense liaison man in Washington was George Ignatieff. While um, I was in Washington, the possibility of a joint command Continental Command, and the concept associated with it of, of doing away with the border for joint defense purposes had come up several times. But um, I was under instructions uh, to go the other way, namely to keep asserting Canadian sovereignty over our airspace 
However, there was a dissenter within our own ranks, none other than the Royal Canadian Air Force. Our airmen didn't share the government's fears, and the Air Force could see a big new role for itself in the air defense of North America, especially if it linked up with the Americans. All the talk, all the training these boys had gone through, boiled down to just one split fraction of a second. They were in business, the Defense of Canada business, and pity the poor guy who walks in without an invitation. General Folks, the chief of the general staff, trusted the Americans completely, and the Liberal government at the time pretty much let the Canadian Armed Forces run themselves. The Canadian and United States military already cooperated in running radar stations in Canada, but General Folks took things much further. Our armed forces worked out an agreement on North American Air Defense, NORAD, that would put all of Canada's airspace under the control of an American-run Joint Military Command. John Diefenbaker's new government took office in 1957. Only weeks later, folks gave the draft of the NORAD Treaty to the new Conservative Defense Minister, General Perks. General Folks had served under General Perks, and on the old boy network had intimated to General Perks that, you know, this has been under discussion for a long time and that it had gone to cabinet. Um, and that all that really was required was, was uh, the Prime Minister's signature on something that was regarded as acceptable. Diefenbaker was inexperienced and he was acting as his own external affairs minister. General Folks passed along just enough information about the NORAD treaty to get his agreement. He didn't explain that, uh, that, uh, that there was some hesitation on the part of the preceding government. I mean, it had been to cabinet, yes, but it had been postponed. But he intimated that it was simply a matter of they were too busy or whatever it was. And we could hardly believe that Charlie Folks had done this, and I telephoned him in some irritation and got a very lofty answer. Now this partnership, which has been carefully nurtured over the past 20 years, is not a partnership between a dictator and a satellite, but it is an arrangement which has been developed between a senior and a junior partner. The first thing external affairs knew about it was that um, it had been pretty well decided and it wasn't even going to be taken to cabinet. Well, far be it from civil servants to tell a prime minister you know, to discuss things with cabinet. How do we approach the prime minister? I have no special feeling to feel intimidated, but to tell him that uh, he'd been had, which is exactly what happened. Joining NORAD made Canada an active partner in American nuclear strategy. But at first, few people in Ottawa realized the implications. The creation of NORAD was certainly quite an honor for Canada. It's the only time the U.S. has ever let foreigners have a direct share in its own military command structure. Back in the 50s, the people in this room controlled the dew-line radars and the fighters and missiles that would have tried to stop incoming Soviet bombers if war broke out between Russia and America. Washington agreed to let Canadians in here because it needed our cooperation and our territory, but also because it trusted Canadians completely. We were really just like Americans, it thought. That isn't entirely true, however, and this basic misunderstanding was the starting point for a political tragedy in three acts. Or maybe just a tragic comedy. The first act began when Diefenbaker discovered that NORAD meant Canada would have to accept nuclear weapons. Yeah, that's when I got back into the act, and it was 58. All that I found was a very confused and irritated Prime Minister. Confused because he hadn't been given the full background. I mean, he had to take the political responsibility and political decision, which bound us in a joint command for continental defense based on nuclear strategy and nuclear weapons. 
and 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 apparently nobody had explained to him that a joint command wasn't just a technical uh, military arrangement that that meant that we were going to go over to nuclear weapons that we had to have um, the same kind of or comparable equipment and also an agreement to acquire nuclear warheads and here for the first time is the firing of the 280 as an atomic cannon sensational films from the Nevada desert At first, the Canadian public hardly noticed that we were going to get nuclear weapons. Nor did Diefenbaker's cabinet. As far as a considerable number of them was concerned, I doubt whether they knew anything very much about it or took very much interest in it. And the uh, fact that these four weapon systems, as they were at that time, were to be equipped with nuclear weapons, uh, I don't think made very much impression on cabinet. <coughs> The moment an alert is sounded, the Bomark shelter automatically splits open. Then the missile is elevated to its firing position. In the late 50s, America's whole strategy depended on nuclear weapons. As part of NORAD, Canada was asked to take nuclear-armed Bomark anti-aircraft missiles and atomic warheads for our fighters. In a war, hundreds of these nuclear weapons would be exploded over Canada. Via TV, we see through the eyes of the victim. We also promised NATO that our Air Force in Europe would acquire American nuclear weapons for use on Eastern Europe. The bombs we would have used were 60 kilotons, three or four times as big as the Hiroshima bomb, but our Air Force didn't mind. Frankly, the idea of having nuclear weapons appealed to our Air Force. Opinions about nuclear weapons were much simpler in those days, and every Air Force with pretensions to the big time wanted to carry little buckets of instant sunshine under its wings. So we bought CF-104s for our Air Force in Europe. They were specially designed for the nuclear strike role. No discussion whatsoever, that I recall, about changing the role of the overseas forces to atomic carriers, because that wasn't in Canada. It wasn't uh, at home here. It didn't pollute Canada with this uh, nasty uh, business. Although it was put us right in the middle of the bombing business, in the context of the times, there may have been some justification in accepting nuclear weapons in our NORAD role to bring down Soviet bombers over the Canadian North. Hard luck in the caribou, but better them than us. But there was only ever one real reason the Canadian forces accepted nuclear weapons in Europe. They wanted to go on playing in the first team. By 1959, we'd agreed to accept nuclear weapons, but the actual warheads would take a couple of years to arrive. And meanwhile, Canadians began to wake up to what was happening. Well, there was no opposition to the acquisition of these weapons until after Howard Green became uh, Minister of External Affairs and got what I would can all only call, I think, a sort of an obsession on his mission to uh, preserve peace in the world and particularly to prevent any nuclear outbreak. If you get nuclear weapons into the hands of, say, 15 countries, then there's just, there just that much more possibility that someone will, will drop a bomb and start a nuclear war. But it wasn't just Howard Green. The Canadian public was showing a growing distaste for nuclear weapons. Anybody's nuclear weapons, and especially the ones like Beaumark, that would be on Canadian soil. At that time, the issue was very much a ban the bomb type of issues, and petitions over petitions were brought to the House of Commons in washing baskets. And there was that fond hope that that would be good enough to persuade the government to do it. And one looked at, at Stephen Baker as a 
parliamentarian in the hopes that he should do that, not thinking that that would require an enormous amount of either political courage or international savvy. And both he and we, I think, underestimated the political aspect of that. Diefenbaker's political instincts told him that Canadians generally were getting unhappy about nuclear weapons. So, having rashly agreed to accept American nuclear weapons, his solution was to stall on the agreement. For years. Do you think Mr. Diefenbaker himself, who certainly supported Howard a great deal of the time, had either emotional or intellectual conviction? No, sir, I do not. I don't think he did. I think he, uh, I used occasionally to see him to talk about uh, nuclear matters, and I never felt that he had any, any really, uh, that he shared this religious conviction. Nor, I must say, that he had any great grasp of, of, uh, of the issue. Diefenbaker's personal confusion about the nuclear question made it impossible to come up with a clear government policy. For example, he started a program to build fallout shelters for government officials. He knew perfectly well that nuclear weapons for Canada were a sensitive political question. But he earnestly went along with other preparations for a nuclear war, like building this central emergency government headquarters at Carp, Ontario, better known as the Diefenbunker. We believe that it's necessary to decentralize, that the, that the capital of Canada, in the ordinary sense, as the capital of the free world, countries anywhere in the world, uh, will have to be moved. Then the plan would envisage a shadow capital to which the Prime Minister, members of the Cabinet, and possibly members uh, would go to. Not exactly a shadow capital. Diefenbaker was rightly scared of nuclear war. All the more so because he didn't have much faith in the wisdom of either the Americans or the Russians. So he built bunkers. But he never made the effort to understand what the nuclear strategy of the time was all about. For example, he probably didn't realize that the Americans were likely to use their nuclear weapons first in a war, and that NORAD was there mainly to deal with the Soviet retaliation. He was operating on sentiment, not reason. But if Diefenbaker really believed that NORAD only existed to save an innocent North America from an unprovoked Soviet nuclear attack, then his opponents had every right to ask why he wasn't accepting American nuclear weapons to protect us. His lack of a coherent answer meant that he was skating on very thin ice politically. President Kennedy's first lecture in traveling statesmanship brings him to Canada, symbolizing neighbor nations standing together in bonds of friendship before a turbulent world. The second act in Diefenbaker's decline and fall opened when John F. Kennedy became president. It was hate at first sight. The two men couldn't stand each other. And Diefenbaker still avoided meeting his commitment to accept U.S. nuclear weapons. It was tied up with the, the whole question of relations with the United States. It was all this business of I'm not going to be pushed around and I'm not going to have pressure put. And, uh, and you must remember that uh, although when one nowadays one sort of thinks of Kennedy as being a sort of embodiment of some kind of lost liberalism or all the rest of it, but when he came up here, what did he put to, to uh, Dief? First of all, we must cut relations with Cuba. Then we must stop trading with China. Altogether, I can describe it, and most sincerely, as one of those meetings that I shall always look back on as representative of the attitude and the closeness of the relationship between our two countries. For almost five years, Diefenbaker had managed to postpone a final decision on U.S. nuclear weapons. But then in 1962 came the Cuban crisis. The U-2 photographs taken over Cuba on Sunday have been processed. Now intelligence is completing its analysis. In these photographs, the intelligence experts were able to pick out such things as service roads, launch pads, Washington put its armed forces on alert and prepared for nuclear war. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States. <laughs> 
requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. We were never told anything about the uh, inner workings of, of uh, Kennedy's mind and his group during the Cuban Missile Crisis. The British were, Macmillan was, but, uh, but we weren't. And this was very, uh, you know, we were, we were being told that this was the hinge of fate. But we never we were told anything about this, what, what, uh, who had pushed on the door. Situation. Diefenbaker simply thought the Americans were overreacting. The USSR contends that there are no offensive weapons or weaponry in Cuba. This is a time not for panic, but for calm resolve. He refused to be hustled into going on a military alert with the Americans, but the defense minister disagreed with him. I went to see Mr. Diefenbaker and uh, told him that this was the situation. He insisted on holding a cabinet meeting and a uh, considerable amount of discussion and uh, a majority of the cabinet, I think without any question, were in favor of, uh, of uh, going on the same alert as the U.S. forces. But uh, Diefenbaker uh, insisted that we not do this immediately. So, following that, I went back to my headquarters, called the chiefs of staff together, that would be in the evening, well, on in the evening, as a matter of fact, and uh, told them that this was the situation, that we'd go on the alert anyway, but say nothing about it. Our armed forces didn't even wait for Harkness's act of disobedience. They were already on alert by late in the afternoon. It was just too abhorrent to me that Canadians should be put in the position, the whole of Canada, of dishonoring its solemn pledge and word. Who was to know what the consequences of President Kennedy's action would be? How wrong it would have been for us to have been caught unaware with neither ships in position, nor ammunition, nor fuel. Somebody had to do it, so I, I said, go ahead, do it. When it came down to the wire, our armed forces chose to go with the Americans, not with their own government. Did Diefenbaker know? No. He didn't, uh, he cert well, he certainly didn't know at the time, but I think he certainly must have <laughs> learned of it later. The take cover warning lasts three minutes. The armed forces had defected over the Cuban crisis, and the Canadian public followed them. Canadians had been scared silly by the threat of nuclear war. Not quite as silly as this National Film Board movie from late 1962 suggests. But by that December, 54% of Canadians thought we should accept U.S. nuclear weapons. However, Diefenbaker didn't notice the Canadian public's new mood. And he didn't realize that the Americans had totally lost patience with him after his performance in the Cuban crisis. I think they thought it was characteristic of the behavior of the Canadian government on all issues, which was to, uh, to not to be carried away by their decisions. And this had evidenced itself, as I say, already over other issues, a number of other issues. And now, to their horror, they found that it would evidence itself even in a matter of what appeared to them to be war or peace. The third and last act of the Diefenbaker drama opened in January 1963. The final push that started Diefenbaker sliding down to defeat came from an unexpected source, NATO headquarters in Paris. Canada was committed to put nuclear weapons on our aircraft in Europe, and it was stalling. So the American general who commanded NATO, Loris Neustadt, visited Ottawa. At the request of the Canadian government, I went to Ottawa and there was a nice lunch, and at the end of this very pleasant lunch, one of the ministers who seemed to be running it introduced me, and the questions started flying. But it started boring down on this, was Canada meeting against commitments. Canada 
uh, permitted some of its force to meet this NATO established requirement. And this we depend upon. So when they asked the question about whether can you the commitment, I just said no. And you've never seen so many people leave a room so fast. <laughs> It was front page news across the country and caused political uproar in Ottawa. For the first time, an American official had implied in public that Canada was not a reliable ally. Northstead had no business coming to Canada and making the statements he did. Now, I don't think the American government was behind that, but a, a different the question of whether the Pentagon was behind it is another matter. And uh, whether our own defense people were, were, were for us is another matter, too. They were using Norstad's visit here in January uh, to unpick the government's position while under the pretense that uh, he was speaking just as a military technician. Nine days after Norstad's visit, Lester Pearson, the liberal opposition leader, changed his policy and said that Canada should take the nuclear weapons after all. And it can only do this by accepting nuclear warheads for those defensive tactical weapons which cannot be used effectively without them, but which we have agreed to use. I went to Diefen Baker immediately and said, well, now there's nothing to it. Even the liberals have agreed that we should go ahead with arming these weapons, so uh, there's no further reason not to, from the political point of view. And he said, oh, yes, yes, oh, we've got to take the opposite position then. <laughs> Diefenbaker was cornered. He'd gone to Nassau in December to meet President Kennedy and Prime Minister Macmillan of Britain. The President could barely be persuaded to speak to him. After the liberal about face on nuclear weapons in January, Diefenbaker counterattacked by telling Parliament that the Nassau meeting had discussed moving NATO's whole strategy away from nuclear weapons. It was not even a half-truth. So the U.S. State Department issued an official press release that called Diefenbaker a liar. Diefenbaker was furious and recalled our ambassador from Washington. By the time I was recalled to uh, part of a, these consul, you know, to mark our displeasure, uh, Dief and the government were then dead set for an election with anti-American overtones, and they thought they could win it. So by then, in a strange way, I, rather naively, the way uh, diplomats are very naive compared to anybody else, thought that uh, we could sort of patch up the difficulty which had arisen over this very arrogant and ham-handed operation of the press release. And I thought that we could get, uh, you know, apologies, understandings, denials, and, you know. But, of course, when I arrived here, I found I was barking up the wrong tree entirely. That was the last thing they wanted was to patch it up, paper over the cracks at all, because they, they, they'd get their eyes set on, a, on an election in which anti-American overtones would play a very important, perhaps victorious part. I believe it is the duty of a Minister of National Defense... Douglas Harkness promptly gave Diefenbaker a chance to put his election strategy into practice. In February 1963, he resigned and brought the government down. I have always believed, in pursuit of this duty as Minister, that we should have nuclear weapons. When you submitted your resignation, did you know it would bring the government down? Well, I was pretty sure it would, yes. And at that point, you reckon this was something necessary to do? Yes. Do you still think so? I still think so. 1963 was the only peacetime election the Canadians have ever fought over defense issues. We have made no agreement upon which Canada has welched or failed. Not one. I don't know what the Tory policy is. Mr. Diefenbaker says, oh, we'll take the nuclear equipment now, and in an emergency, we'll get the warhead. In an emergency. The curtain had fallen on the Diefenbaker government. Pearson won the election on a nuclear platform. 
For the moment, at least, Canadians had learned to stop worrying and love the bomb, so long as it belonged to our side. The U.S.-Canada nuclear agreement was signed at 11 o'clock this morning. The still, of course, remain under Canadian command and Canadian control. The beginning of the Pearson government in 1963 marked the high point in our relationship with the United States. The border between us had practically vanished in the eyes of many Canadians, and the American view of the world was almost universally accepted in Canada, too. We began our independent history with a profound mistrust of American intentions and a determination to keep our distance from the United States. But through our close association with the Americans in the Second World War and then in the Cold War, we gradually lost our caution and grew to trust the U.S. government. For a good two decades after 1945, Canadians generally saw the United States as not only the most powerful country in the world, but also the wisest and the best. In the end, that was what destroyed the Diefenbaker government. Canadians simply admired and believed the U.S. government more than their own. The fall of John Diefenbaker was, if you like, a demonstration of the length of our leash in terms of our relations with the United States. The length of that leash was always partly determined by the attitude of the Canadian public itself. In 1963, we felt so close to the Americans that we mourned the death of John Kennedy as if he had been one of our own. But the mid-60s were a turning point in Canadian-U.S. relations. The Americans went through a very bad patch, burning their own cities at home and other people's villages in Vietnam. By 1968, many Canadians realized that the United States was just another great power, behaving not much better or worse than all the other great powers of history. This gave the new Prime Minister, Pierre Trudeau, a considerably longer leash. Our defense policy now was more to impress our friends than frighten our enemies. Our contribution Trudeau also had more freedom because Canadian territory was no longer so important to American strategy. The new ballistic missiles were unstoppable, so air defense against bombers was a waste of time and money. Both we and the Americans lost interest in NORAD. And Trudeau was not sure that any of our other defense commitments were necessary. The fundamental issue was uh, really, uh, did we fulfill our essential purposes better by uh, restricting our defenses to the North American continent? Or did we have to extend them across the ocean uh, to Europe? The Canadian forces had been in Europe for almost 20 years, and the men around Trudeau wondered if it still made sense for us to belong to NATO. So Trudeau launched a major review of our defense and foreign policy. 28 heads of diplomatic missions are contributing to the Foreign and Defense Policy Review. It's the first major ambassadorial consultation of the Trudeau administration. Mr. Trudeau, for example, said we're going to look at neutrality, we're going to look at non-alignment, we're going to look at just having a defense alliance with the United States. We're going to look at them all. We start from zero and we examine every possible alternative. That was the philosophy behind the defense review, but Trudeau never really attacked NORAD or our membership in NATO. All the energy went into examining our military commitment in Europe. It is important that Canada maintains its engagement in Europe, uh, that a possible enemy will meet many nationalities. And the number of soldiers, of course, is also important, but is less important than the fact that they are present. Their presence automatically commits Canada to any war that breaks out in Europe, which explains why the Europeans want our troops there, but not why we should oblige them. And there are no good military reasons. But there are other kinds of reasons. The Europeans and the Americans reward us for playing along by letting us sit at the high table. Do you really think Canada, for example, would be a member of the Summit of the Seven? <laughs> 
if it excluded itself from NATO and participation in our common defense. Uh, I think there are a number of very tangible benefits for Canada, which give Canada weight and status in the world. In some respects, maybe even out of proportion to its size, if Canada were to terminate its presence, I think it would find itself very much on the sidelines. The fragile self-esteem of Canadians might not stand the shock of being excluded from the high councils of the West, even though we have practically no influence on the military decisions that are taken there. And Trudeau also hoped that Canada's military contribution to NATO would earn us closer political and economic links with Europe. He realized that uh, Canada's influence, particularly in Europe, which is always needed if it's going to be a counterbalance to American weight on Canada, was going to depend on uh, taking more notice than he had earlier on of European feelings about what Canada did. Trudeau never really wanted to leave our alliances anyway. He just wanted to widen our freedom of maneuver and cut defense costs. So in the end, he settled for one money-saving change, cutting our forces in Europe in half, and one symbolic gesture, giving our nuclear weapons back to the Americans. After 1970, we rapidly got rid of our nuclear weapons in Europe, and these aircraft struggled on for another decade and a half in a conventional ground attack role they were never designed for. Only now are the squadrons here finally getting an aircraft more appropriate to their non-nuclear role, the F-18s. Denuclearizing our NORAD forces took even longer. The last Genie nuclear missiles were only handed back to the Americans in 1984. But at last our hands are clean, something like Pontius Pilots. You satisfied all the elements uh, ideologically by withdrawing from uh, the nuclear role. Uh, mind you, I question myself uh, whether it's uh, it's uh, really uh, you have to be congratulated from uh, uh, withdrawing from pulling the trigger when you say to your colleague and ally pull it yourself we still belong to alliances whose strategy says we will use nuclear weapons first if necessary Declaring ourselves non-nuclear was a worthwhile gesture, but only a gesture. Even after the defense review, Trudeau spent as little on the Canadian Armed Forces as our allies would tolerate. But by 1975, this policy had greatly weakened our armed forces, and our allies began twisting our arms rather hard. I had made my principal role that of the revival of NATO and the strengthening of the security of Western Europe. I went up to Ottawa and I suggested to the Prime Minister and to members of the Cabinet, suppose Western Europe were not protected. Suppose indeed Western Europe fell under the control of the Soviet Union. And suppose the United States thereby was slowly forced back into the Western Hemisphere. How would Canadians like being locked up here in the North American continent with an America that felt defeated and mean-spirited. I don't think the Canadians would feel very comfortable under those circumstances. That was perhaps a point with a touch of malice, uh, but I think they got the point. And the problem with being the neighbor of a superpower is that you often have to get the point. Trudeau bought new tanks as requested. He has a wry sense of humor, and every time I've seen him s since then, he waggles his finger at me and says, you made me buy those damn tanks. Trudeau had been trying to bring Canadian defense policy more into line with our own real needs. But our ties of trade and culture with other Western countries make it very hard for us to treat defense policy on its own merits. And we're strategic territory, so the Americans demand our cooperation. We seem to be pinned down by our history and geography. We live where we do, in between the Russians and the Americans, and uh, that reality isn't going to change. And the idea that uh, we can be neutral is a dream. I've had Russians tell me, you know, if you think that uh, if there's a war that you're going to escape it, uh, 
you got another thing coming. Well, you you find me a nation which is uh, like a butterfly that uh, sort of uh, skips around from one garden to another and moves itself uh, between oceans and over continents and pretends to be one thing one day and another thing another day. There aren't any. We're all stuck on our flypaper. So what? We make the best of it. And some of us do fairly well and some of us die. We can't move ourselves, but there is more than one way of dealing with the dilemma of living next door to a superpower. The Finns make the best of it too, but they do it differently. Finland has a thousand mile border with the Soviet Union, and it's important strategic territory for Moscow, just as Canada is for Washington. But it's not allied to the Russians, and its political system is entirely different. Finland is a democratic, capitalist, and neutral country. Finland is a non-aligned country, non-aligned in order to preserve neutrality in wartime. Uh, but if we will be able to do that, that's an open question, of course. Like many neutrals, Finland has to put a lot of effort into making its territory safe. The Finns have universal conscription, and they could mobilize 600,000 soldiers out of a population of only 5 million people. There's only one little catch to Finland's neutrality. Something called the Finnish-Soviet Treaty of Friendship, Mutual Cooperation and Assistance. The treaty stipulates that if there is an attack on Finland or on the Soviet Union through Finnish territory, Finland will uh, uh, defend uh, itself. And uh, <coughs> by giving this assurance to the Soviet Union, uh, we uh, make it clear in advance how Finland will behave. Finland has promised Moscow that it will resist any Western attempt to get at the Russians across Finnish territory. If they can't stop NATO's forces themselves, according to the treaty, then they'll ask the Russians in to help. But only then. The treaty does mean that the Finns could well end up fighting Americans. It's the price they have to pay for keeping the Russians off their backs. Do they know who they might have to fight? Yeah, nowadays I, I'm pretty sure they do. Yeah. Doesn't bother them? No. No at all. Canadians are just as practical as the Finns. We live next to the Americans, so we've agreed to fight the Russians. Pundits in the West often talk loosely about Finlandization. It's a sort of code word for becoming too subservient to the wishes of your local superpower. But in that case, maybe the word should really be Canadianization, because we Canadians cooperate far more closely with the Americans than the Finns do with the Soviet Union. I know there's a difference. We climbed into bed with the Americans because it was comfortable and because we're so much alike. Whereas the Finns keep as distant as they can from the Russians because there's a huge gulf between their political and social systems and their whole outlook in the world. The Finns have managed to move a few steps away from the alliance game in peacetime, but they couldn't refuse the Russians their cooperation in wartime. And like the Finns, we Canadians can do nothing about our situation in wartime. The Americans would get our cooperation one way or another. But we go further than that and belong to America's alliances in peacetime. Above all, we're friends, and friends we shall always be. The U.S. is not our enemy, but it's not our friend either. It's a great power, and great powers don't have friends. They only have interests. We're one of America's interests. <laughs> 
We're enthusiastic about the research done so far on our strategic defense initiative. Keeping the Americans happy seems to me to be a part of uh, Canadian national interest if you want to strike the underlying note of realism or cynicism. Very frequently the attitude on the part of American leaders is that Canada should play a role which is acquiescent at worst and a cheerleader at best. We've almost always acquiesced, but now would be a very good time to reconsider our habit, because the nuclear arms race is about to take a huge leap forward and American demands on Canada are rising rapidly, mostly as a result of Star Wars. Star Wars pretends to be a solution that would save all of North America from nuclear war, but it's really just part of the problem. The idea of an astrodome over North America is bunk. And what the Americans are desperately trying to do is to, to produce a defense for their land-based missiles, which of course accelerates the arms race. Star Wars won't help people to survive, just missiles. It's simply the latest American tactic in the struggle for nuclear superiority. And Star Wars has major implications for Canada. First of all, there's cruise missiles. Our territory is becoming vital once again, because if Soviet ballistic missiles couldn't get through the American space defenses, the Russians would have to depend on bombers and cruise missiles that would fly low and slow down across the Arctic towards North American targets. If Washington goes ahead with its Star Wars concept for anti-missile defense, then continental air defense comes back into fashion too. aerospace defense for the North American continent involves an absolute minimum a certain amount of Canadian real estate for fighter refueling or staging bases, for radar sites, uh, and for various other physical features that are essential to any such uh, defense. Bombers and cruise missiles are becoming important again, and so NORAD is too. That's why Canada is already being forced to pour money into radar stations and air defenses again. The North Warning Line is only the first installment. Star Wars means that NORAD itself will change. In the new scenario, Star Wars defenses would destroy enemy ballistic missiles, while fighters shot down Russian bombers and cruise missiles. Meanwhile, American bombers and ICBMs would be attacking the Soviet Union. With high-speed computers now available, it no longer makes military sense to split defense and offense into separate commands. NORAD, Strategic Air Command, and Space Command may all end up under a single U.S. commander. And the question is, how will Canada fit in? So far, the Canadian government is officially refusing a role in Star Wars, but our armed forces have worked out a secret joint plan with the U.S. military, SDA 2000, which leaves the door wide open for us to start cooperating on space defense later on. Nobody likes to be frozen out. If we do commit ourselves, we'll probably become junior partners in a new command structure where defensive elements like NORAD and Star Wars are more openly integrated with the offensive nuclear forces that would strike the Soviet Union. But let's be honest, these changes would only make more obvious what's already true. Canada is part of the U.S. nuclear war machine. <laughs> All these Canadian pilots at Cold Lake are part of the evolving U.S. nuclear strategy, whether they recognize it or not. Uh, you notice they're doing that weave business back and forth going yeah. up there? I got me a little confused at first, then I realized that's a tactic they use for escort, sweeping back and forth like that, sort of checking. I think the Soviets look at the Warsaw Pact countries as a buffer zone between actual Soviet soil and uh, Western Europe. Um, hopefully the Americans look at it a little differently. The Americans don't see us differently at all. We are strategic territory and they will use us.
over 15 years, maybe going back as much as 20 years, the U.S. military has had plans to put nuclear weapons on Canadian soil, and the Canadian government was never privy to that information. Likewise, there are other aspects of what the United States plans to do on Canadian soil. The dispersal of bombers, the dispersal of air fighter interceptors, of tankers, of strategic airplanes, the use of Canadian bases for communications and command and control, which to a large degree the Canadian government prefers not to speak about. At times of military crisis, you know, uh, normal rules don't apply. Normal democratic rules don't apply. Government are not asked. Could I please drop a bomb here? Would you move? We can't go on living pretending it will always be like this. Because we not only owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our children, to posterity. If we continue to, to up the ante, uh, each one trying to be superior to the other in nuclear weapons, one of these days this is going to uh, blow up in our face. And, uh, and millions will die. The present system of nuclear armed alliances locks the whole northern hemisphere on a course for nuclear war. still peace. For as long as we can see ahead, the, the Soviet Union and the United States will dominate, in my view, the landscape of world politics. And therefore, the question becomes, how do we prevent war? Our best hope for survival is to lower the level of international paranoia. And that's not just a Soviet responsibility. We have to accept that our alliances frighten the Russians as much as their military power scares us. Nothing Canada can do within its alliances seems able to change the nature of the great power game. So maybe we should just walk out, quit our alliances. Canadian withdrawal from NATO and NORAD could be a catalyst for dissolving the alliances. And nobody has a stronger reason than Canada for doing that. It's only the existence of those alliances that makes us a deliberate target for anybody's missiles. If we Canadians ever did want to take our distance from our various American-led alliances, Finland is a good model for how far we could hope to go. Maybe Canada could pull out of the Western alliance system without having to face an American intervention, provided that we guaranteed to stop anybody else crossing Canadian territory to attack the United States, and to ask American forces in the instant we couldn't handle it ourselves. Finlandization is certainly the only real strategic option for Canada, apart from clinging to the bosom of NATO and NORAD. Doing a Finland would not be cheap. We'd still have to protect our territory. We'd have some special troops to deal with land incursions, but that isn't very likely. Most of our effort would go into patrolling our skies and seas, which would cost a lot. On the other hand, we'd save a lot by pulling our NATO troops out of Europe, so it would probably come out about even in the end. Maybe it would be better to say, all right, we will do our thing, and you go on doing your thing. Partly because I, I think one of the reasons I'm inclined that way is that I don't know what will change the Americans. Uh, and the Russians in this they're, game. They're locked into it. They're locked into it. We're locked into it too, but Canadians are getting very worried about the implications of Star Wars, and the concern is even spilling over into broader questions. Canada has always belonged to an empire or an alliance, and the idea of doing anything else is alien to us. We believe that building strong alliances would prevent war. And even though we often got war out of that behavior in the end, it always happened far from home. But the next world war, if it comes, would destroy Canada. And maybe our old political reflexes are not the best guide to survival in this new situation.
we should at least be asking ourselves if there is no other option. The only real alternative to our present policy is to pull out of our alliances. Withdrawal from NATO and NORAD could be expensive for Canada, especially if the United States tried to punish us economically or by other means. But no major industrial power has ever gone on a line before. If we quit, some of the smaller NATO members might follow our example. Of course, the Russians and the Americans aren't suddenly going to decide they've been wrong all these years. Unraveling the alliances would be a long and risky business without a predictable outcome. It couldn't succeed at all unless we found some way of making the United Nations work, because an international security system is still the only alternative to a world divided into armed camps. We have no map of the future, so we can't be certain that any course will lead us to safety. But things have got so serious that we really should consider all the options and not just blindly follow tradition.